Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the nuts and bolts of Open and OER. We have about a minute uh, before we really get started here, but I wanted to open up the lobby and uh, make sure that everybody's doing just fine. If you can hear me, um, then your camera is work. I mean, your mic is. You know what? I mean. Your speakers are working. If you cannot, um, if not, more audio options. There we go. Uh, this meeting will be recorded uh, and it will be transcribed uh, for accessibility purposes. And we will be able to share this out on the website afterwards. So um, more folks who are not able to make it today will be able to see this later on. So thanks so much for being here. Uh, I'm Jeff Gallant. I'm the program director of Affordable Learning Georgia. Uh, we're a system wide initiative for both OER and other affordable resources, including uh, free and open uh, materials and library resources. And uh, with us today is Nikita Afaha, our program manager. Uh, we also have two special guest librarians in Charlene Martoni and in Susanna Smith. So we're going to get started. Our plan today, we're going to go through the basics of Open and OER. Then we'll have a guest speaker. We're going to break this up a little bit. Then we'll talk a little bit about um, how Open and OER have gone in the USG, just so, like, a couple of examples, and then guest speaker two. Um, then a bit about what to do next, and then we want to hear from you. Nikita is going to be running uh, some polls at that point to see what you would like to know, what you're thinking, how, how you're feeling about all of this. Uh, so, the first thing to talk about are high textbook prices. They're what started Affordable Learning Georgia. Uh, if learning were affordable already, we wouldn't have had to exist. Uh, but right now, we are hearing from quite a few folks that the high price of textbooks are still hurting students. They are a hidden cost that can uh, really wind up ruining some plans. Um, Char uh, Charlene, not Charlotte, this was spelled wrong in here. Um, she had assembled quite a few student quotes, and she might talk a little bit about that um, during all of this. Uh, but you can see that there are some quotes in here from students that are talking about buying groceries or paying for, uh, you know, being forced to pay for access codes that are already ridiculously expensive. Um, textbook costs being the major thing that could make or break a student. Um, they're the reason why we're doing what we're doing. Uh, even though over in the system office, we're working with faculty and staff to get this stuff done, it is ultimately all about students. And yes, prices everywhere have skyrocketed, but college textbook prices have skyrocketed quite a bit. Uh, since 2000, the average price increase uh, up to 2022, which, you know, it's gone up a little bit since then, uh, was 74% increase on the original cost, 162% for textbook costs. So it wasn't just inflation that did it. Uh, textbook costs went very high, very out of control. Um, so this was something that we... Uh, started addressing, especially when it rose more than usual around 2011, 2012. And this happens nationwide. Uh, this is over in Florida. Uh, Florida Virtual Campus is fortunate to be able to do a student survey that catches just about every student that they have. Uh, this is 13,000 responses here uh, of public college students asked about high textbook costs and how they affected them. Um, half of them did not buy a required textbook for their course. Four out of 10 students avoided registering for a course because they took a look at the syllabus, saw what that textbook costed, and went, no thank you, or they just uh, dropped out during that ad drop period uh, in one four students dropping a course. Uh, one in three students reported that they earned a poor grade because of high textbook costs, because things like not purchasing a required textbook for the course. It's unequal access to materials when some of your students can afford what's there and others cannot. Uh, so that's kind of the basics of the why of ALG. Now, OER is one great way of uh, 
of helping with this, of not just reducing textbook costs, but also enabling new kinds of teaching and learning at the same time. Yes, they're free to use and they're free to keep. Uh, they're out there provided uh, by places like us, places like Rice University's OpenStax and OER Commons, um, and they are at zero cost, uh, including data costs. It's not like you have to uh, log in in order to access an open educational resource. You are able to download that thing, make a copy of it, keep it, um, and there's no tracking on you, no data selling. It doesn't disappear after a certain amount of time. But it's also flexible uh, for instructors. So obviously, if you just had a textbook from 2010, you think about a print textbook that's covered in pictures and text, you wouldn't necessarily be able to update that print text very easily, right? Open licenses uh, are there to let folks know that this digital resource can be customized. Uh, the permissions are built right into it. And because of that customization, not only can you make things more current, but you can also make them more relevant for your students. So one of the pioneers in open education was uh, MIT. They made open courseware, and it was one of the first things that shared out uh, instructor materials with the rest of the world. And that's great if they're just free, but they are MIT resources for MIT students who had a different kind of prerequisite when they got into a lot of these courses. So it didn't work for everybody to just see MIT courseware. You had to be able to customize it in order to make anything relevant to students at another institution. And not only that, and we're talking a little bit about textbooks here, but open educational resources aren't just those. Uh, open videos, open audio, open images, they are all able to be. Yes, we will definitely share the PowerPoint with all of uh, the participants. So yeah, thank you for asking that, Centoria. Um, and not only that, but it goes beyond the usual you get what you pay for schema in um, you know, the, the normal market. These are authored by experts and institutions, and they are shared uh, by experts at institutions who know how to share things, who know metadata. Uh, they know about how to keep things safe. Uh, and so they are written by faculty, they're customized by faculty, they're adopted by more faculty, they can be reviewed by faculty as well. Uh, there, there's pre-production peer review, OpenStax tends to do that, the University of North Georgia Press does that as well. There's post-production peer review uh, over on the Open Textbook Library. Uh, folks take an entire rubric and they rate everything about it and they give descriptions uh, throughout the rubric of the different features of a particular textbook. And uh, also, librarians are there to help. Instructional designers are there to help, too, when it comes to creation and customization. So not only do you have expert knowledge, but you also have the expert knowledge in creating these things and sharing them, too. So there's a whole ecosystem behind it. But the tools behind open when it comes to open education are Creative Commons licenses. So there are open licenses that uh, were not meant for software. You've probably heard about things like the GNU GPL. Those licenses are a little bit different. They are meant for computer software. Um, they're meant for source code and how that can be shared. With Creative Commons licenses, we're often sharing something in a PDF or we're sharing it on a website or we're sharing a Word document. And you can't really say, OK, well, the source code for Microsoft Word is here. And that doesn't make any sense. Uh, but when you're doing a creative work using software, that's when you would use a Creative Commons license. And therefore, most open educational resources are going to be under those. Now, if you're in computer science, a little bit different, right? You might be sharing stuff under uh, the GNU GPL or Berkeley Free Software License. Um, these licenses are built on one building block, and that's attribution. You have to attribute the original resource. You have to give credit to the original resource that you used, that open resource, uh, to preserve the history 
of what it is that you made. So even if you make a new version of a text, people should be able to find the old version and know exactly how it was. Uh, faculty tend to be somewhat apprehensive about um, well, what if somebody makes a bad version of my open textbook? But if you're attributing it the correct way, that should be a problem. Uh, so don't worry about the uh, the openness kind of coming back to bite you. Attribution always preserves that history. Now, there's one that doesn't have attribution in it in Creative Commons licenses, and that's CC0. We'll talk a little bit about that as well. <laughs> oh, oh, I bet you can hear my dog. Hold on a second. You'll get to see my dog in a picture uh, just a little bit later, by the way. Um, so Creative Commons licenses have the four big building blocks. We already talked about attribution. So you usually see the CC by uh, in there sometimes, say Creative Commons, attribution. And then there's other stuff. The, the other stuff makes things a little bit more restrictive when you're applying a Creative Commons license, but it can help. Uh, for example, non-commercial means that you can't create derivative works for commercial use. If you're really just trying to pass that freedom along um, and your concerns that uh, commercial companies might um, exploit what you've created, you can put a non-commercial license on it. Now, in open educational resources, that's optional. Um, sometimes folks want things to be just maximally open, and that's totally fine. You don't have to have a non-commercial license on it. Um, but if you want to, you totally can. Share alike is a bit like the open source um, ones that you've seen out there too. Usually if there's open source software that you build upon, you have to put it under the same license. So you're passing that freedom along. Share alike does the same thing. Uh, so you, if you put CC by SA, that means share alike. That means that if you use somebody else's resource, you have to also put that same open license on your work. So it's not just that you're attributing the original, but now you have a by SA work that you're passing on to the next folks who are then going to make a new open resource, pass that along um, with a share alike license, and they'll do the same. Uh, it's kind of a pr uh, passing along the responsibility of freedom type of thing. Now, the last one that you can add on a Creative Commons license is especially made for the arts. And I said before it was made for creative industries or creative fields. Uh, the arts are one of them. And sometimes art can be very uh, personal. It can be something that nobody wants to be altered. You can also have in open research uh, some research articles that people don't want to have remixed. They just want them reproduced as is. And they can do that. They can put a no derivatives uh, addendum on their Creative Commons license. And that means that you cannot uh, customize it in any way. In education, like we already said, that doesn't help as much. Uh, you, you should be able to customize things for your students. You should be able to keep it up to date. And you can't really do that if you put a no derivatives license on an open educational resource. So we tend to even see these as eh, kind of open. Mostly they are just free. You don't want to use those in, in education. Uh, so let's sand off a bit of the jargon. Uh, this is, by the way, uh, a jargon from Dragon Quest, uh, a dragon holding a jar. Uh, the Creative Commons types, um, you can put them together. So for example, by SA, attribution share alike. By NC, attribution non-commercial. By NCSA, you can put it all together. But those four are really it for open educational resources with a little asterisk there. Otherwise, as soon as you put an ND on things, other stuff gets voided out. You can do non-commercial no derivatives. Uh, you can definitely not use a no derivatives work for commercial purposes. But you can't share alike because you're not doing other sharing. You're only sharing the file as is. There's no remixing. There's no customizing. So the ND stuff, we don't usually want to use that in open education anyway. 
means that really you've got four combinations of Creative Commons licenses, and that's about all that you're going to need to know. So CC BY, you just attribute the original resource. BY SA, you attribute the original resource, you share it under that same one, passing that freedom along. Uh, BY NC, you don't um, use it for commercial purposes, you're not making a profit. Uh, BY NC SA, it's the whole shebang. Um, don't use it for profit, share it under the same license. So there is an asterisk here, and we will get to why, but just a second on that. So here's Rocket, by the way. If you heard her bark, that is her. Um, attributing a work here is definitely an easy thing to do. Um, the only thing you really need to say is that the work is under a Creative Commons license. And then folks who attribute that work We'll say that it's under a Creative Commons, uh, the Creative Commons license that you put on there. All of the hard legal work has been done on the back end. If you go to creativecommons.org, you can see uh, the human readable deed, which is uh, a very simplified way of seeing all of the legal stuff behind a Creative Commons license. You can read the whole legal deed, which spells out everything, every definition, um, answers any questions you would ever have uh, as a specialist in this field. Uh, but yeah, when you're attributing someone else's work, make sure that you get the title, make sure that you get uh, the author or the authors, uh, and then you say it's under a Creative Commons uh, attribution, attribution non-commercial share alike, et cetera, 4.0 international license, and that's it. You really do not have to do more than that to attribute someone else's work. Now, if you're going to put a license on your work, you basically do this too, and that's it. However, you can make it a little bit more useful online. You can go in and get a machine readable license, which is it just uses HTML embed codes. And you put that um, into the chooser, which is, hey, I you can say, I know which license I want, and it won't even ask you any questions. And just be like, oh, which license do you want? You can pick it, and then you've got it. You've got the embed code there. Um, it can ask you, hey, do you want people to be able to remix your work. Yeah, then you answer that stuff and it will suggest exactly which license you want. It all winds up with an HTML embed code that gives you the little picture and a clickable link to the deed uh, to the license so that everybody knows the details right off the bat. Uh, and plus, if you have this stuff out on Google and you've got that embed code, Google then knows that it is Creative Commons licensed. Now, not everybody uses uh, any kind of advanced search tools th these days, it's harder and harder to get to them, as most librarians know and are uh, con uh, consistently not happy about. But you are able to filter stuff by Creative Commons licenses on the back end of these. So it still helps to have a machine readable license, even just for search purposes. Now, that one asterisk that I've been mentioning has been the CC0 uh, part of Creative Commons. This is not really a Creative Commons license. This is a way to put works into the public domain. Uh, so not only are you saying, yes, you can uh, take this and you can remix it, revise it, reproduce it, but also you are saying you don't even have to attribute it, which means that you can do whatever you want with it. No rights reserved is what they say. Now, that's cool. If you just want to share something out with the world and make it maximally useful, uh, you know, get your photos out on Wikimedia Commons. Flickr used to be a place to do that. That's great. Uh, there's awesome public domain stuff out there that people use all the time for, you know, B-roll, background footage, stuff like that. Um, it's not very common in educational resources. And the reason why is that you should be able to see the history of an educational resource. You should be able to go back and say, okay, well, this Canadian strategic management text had a strategic management text from America that it remixed. So let's go back. Okay, we found the US one. Now we can update the US one and bring it over. Uh, so yeah, <clears throat> public domain can be maximally open, but for education, sometimes it's a little too open. Sometimes we want to keep a little bit of that provenance of resources. Um, there's more about the public domain if you are not familiar with it. 
Uh, we've shared some links on here, and we will share these presentation slides afterwards. Um, as most librarians know, the Stanford Libraries Copyright and Fair Use Center is a nice little place to look about the uh, details of public domain. Uh, but also, there's fun things you can do with public domain. Um, a lot of folks are probably familiar with openculture.org, but there's also the Public Domain Review, which is a news site about stuff that's in the public domain. They do fun things bringing public domain uh, content together into one thing. Uh, they do like thematic things. It's, it's really neat. Now, some facts about open licensing you should know before you get started on just open licensing all the things. Open licensing is forever. Um, once you put a Creative Commons license on something, you can't take it away. And that's really helpful if somebody wants to remix and revise a resource. If they've been doing that for, let's say, three years, they've got something that was under a CC BY license, and suddenly the owners took the CC BY license away, is that copyright infringement, even though they've been following it? Uh, no, because CC BY licenses, any Creative Commons license, is irrevocable. It is forever. You can open them further, though. So let's say you had a CC BY SA open textbook. And five years down the line, you go, you know what? Companies aren't really using this. I'm not really worried about the non-commercial thing. We're going to make it CC BY SA. You can totally do that. You can enable more folks to use your stuff in more ways. You just can't take that back. You can't take permissions back that you've already given out. Now, also, open licenses do not give your copyright away. Let's say that I have a non-commercial open textbook, and I really want to make a premium uh, version of it with a whole bunch of videos that I've poured all of my time and effort into, and I really can't um, make it under the same license. I need to be able to uh, make some money off of this. Well, because I am the creator of it, and open licenses do not take the copyright away from the creator, you can totally do that. You can make a new version of your uh, text that has you know, a complete premium version. We've made a Kindle version. It took us a long time to make this Kindle version. Please help us recoup the cost, five bucks or something like that. You can totally do that. It does not take your copyright away. Other people cannot take your licensed work and say, well, now I have the copyright and do that as well. You, you retain the copyright when you put a Creative Commons license onto something. So how does this all work together? What is it about open that's a little bit better than just having a free resource hanging out there on the web? Well, you've got, first of all, expert educators, expert librarians sharing them, expert instructional designers helping structure everything and uh, gear it towards cool kinds of pedagogy. Uh, that's going to be coordinated by some sort of lead author or lead editor, and then that's going to be put into the classroom, right? So it's always creation with a purpose, creation with a use. At that point, um, after that, the author permissions that were put on those open license materials, that will enable folks to customize and share, right? But you can't just keep it in your learning management system and say, well, it's open, here you go, because uh, nobody can get into that learning management system. If somebody shares it out, um, that's how it's going to work. Uh, librarians are often the ones who are sharing out open educational resources through places like digital repositories. Uh, we have OpenALG for that. We also have Galileo Open Learning Materials. There are some free places where you can share your stuff too, like OER Commons, Merlot Content Builder, um, you're, you're able to, with some file size limits, uh, share your open resources just on a global scale. Um, then that stuff gets shared out, and because of the open license and because people are trying to get the word out about it, here are these new textbooks that we have. Here's how they're discoverable. That way, it gets out to other folks. Those other folks can adopt it, and go, oh, okay, well, it's CC BY. I can use it for free. That's great. But let's make a huge revision of it. Uh, edits and additions and ancillaries get made. And then those are shared out too. So you wind up with this cycle. 
folks definitely have a purpose in using open educational resources. But in order to use them the best, they have to revise them and remix them. By sharing out those revisions, we have hopefully, ideally, a cycle that keeps open resources going and going and going over time with then uh, updates to the metadata, updates to hosting, new places to share it. Then new teams can take that stuff and remix it too. Maybe they're putting it into a video. Uh, maybe they are creating an entirely new open textbook through combining multiple chapters in one place. Any of things like that. More barking. So, you know, every single time that I have uh, some sort of event, that's when people decide to mow their lawns outside. That That's just how it goes. Um, that is every single time. They look at my calendar, I swear. Uh, but yeah, the life cycle on this means that we should be able to perpetuate it through implementation and remixing and revising. The stuff that Open already allows. So open's not just free, it's also something that's sustainable over time. But what about fair use? Well, be sure that you know that this is a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, this is something between instructors and librarians and uh, specialists and scholarly communications folks know fair use very well. Um, this is often something that is implemented in the learning management system. It's not something that is shared openly. That's not kind of how that part works. But if you would like to know more about fair use, th this is a whole presentation in itself. This is a conference in itself, really. Um, but there is a code of best practices and fair use for OER. Uh, it's done by some rock stars in the OER world, like Will Cross over in North Carolina. Uh, the ARL has a code of best practices and fair use for academic and research libraries. So if you want to take a step back from open education and go, okay, well, how does fair use work in academia writ large? There you go. Um, and then what about trademarks? So not just copyright stuff, but what about uh, if I use Sonic the Hedgehog? That's a Sega property. That's a little bit different from copyright, which is like a thing that you copy and make. The, the trademark's a little bit different. How does that work with fair use? Um, the INTA has a little guide uh, intended for a non-legal audience. It works a lot of the same way. Just think about uh, operating in good faith with that stuff. Uh, if you have an e-reserves program, this will be way easier too. Uh, Nikita has said uh, you can drop questions in the Q&A. I just checked the Q&A and saw that there. So please do take note of that as well. Uh, we are going to move on uh, to our first guest speaker, and that is Charlene, not Charlotte, I have to fix that on the presentation, Martoni. Um, <laughs> I'm going to uh, bring this over to her. Uh, I think you're able to take control. Are you able to? I think so. Yes. Let's see. Okay. Mm -hmm. How did, am I sharing my screen? Am I sharing my you presentation? Are. You're okay. sharing the presentation. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, well, thank you for inviting me to share a little sneak peek into one of GSU's current OER projects. Right now, we're developing a research project to investigate the OER landscape um, at Georgia State University. So uh, my research team, in addition to myself, are Hallie Riley, Christina Gangswitch, Denise George, and Jason Puckett. And to start us off, I think it's important that we um, get a context for GSU. So GSU was founded in 1913 in Atlanta, and we merged with Perimeter College in 2016. So we now have six campuses located throughout the metropolitan area with a population of over 50,000 students. Um, next slide, I think I haven't been clicking it. Someone else. Okay. Is. is it, is it over on the quick facts, uh, slide? Yeah. So next one is, is. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, it wasn't moving without, uh, me taking control, unfortunately. So I have to do that. <laughs> That's okay. I wasn't sure I could see all the slides. Um, but thank you very much. Yeah. So, uh, the 
The merger with Perimeter is really significant for the design of our research because we are seeking to understand how OER manifests differently on the various GSU campuses. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So we're designing a cross-sectional web-based anonymous survey of educators who taught at GSU between 21 and 2024. And our intent is to understand the ways in which educators use open access and open educational resources, as well as low cost and university licensed or library licensed resources. And we're also seeking to assess motivation and barriers to the use of the resources, as well as how our strategic plan has impacted their use. And finally, we want to investigate various demographic factors like someone's department or their discipline or their faculty status. So our design for the research study, uh, it's informed by user experience design theory in addition to motivation theory, which helps us to understand how potential contributing factors uh, impact the way that faculty are inclined to use open educational resources. Motivation theory in academic context is discussed in a 2023 article by Herbert Clinton Lysel and Stupinski. It's titled Faculty Motivation for OER Textbook Adoption and Future Use. I highly recommend giving that a read. And our research design is also informed by a 2017 article by Cox and Trotter titled An OER Framework, Heuristic and Lens, uh, a Tool for Understanding Lecturers' Adoption of OER. So the researchers in this article, uh, the 2017 article, they found that using these tools helped them to make comparisons between institutions while keeping their institutional differences in mind. As librarians and educators, we know that educational affordability can be maximized by combining the use of open resources with the integration of university licensed resources in a holistic way. So our approach in the design of this research is to collect data on the use of both. Um, both open and university licensed resources, and we've also identified that there are barriers to the effective study of our population of educators, and those barriers are varying levels of familiarity with open education and also differing interpretations of the definitions for the various open educational practices and tools. So our approach is to design a survey with our users in mind and remove the need for them to have familiarity with open educational resources or its complicated evolution. Instead, we will focus on collecting rich, detailed data and doing the analysis work on our end uh, to benchmark the findings with current iterations of OER concepts. To describe one of our study populations, which is the materials, we have decided to use the term open and affordable learning materials, and we've defined it broadly to encompass required educational materials that are either no cost, low cost, and or university licensed materials. This definition, though, is presented in plain language for the respondents, so they don't need to understand the difference between an open access resource, open education, or they don't need to know the license that's coming with it. So here are a few examples of how the research design manifests in the design of the survey. The first example shows that we've simplified the various types of resources and the various Creative Commons licenses and ways that you can share them using a matrix table to ask about their use. We've also quoted the university's strategic plan and asked respondents how it impacted their motivation to use open and affordable learning materials. And we've also explicitly asked about the impact of tenure and promotion on their motivation. So our research design is currently in the final editing stages and we'll be submitting to our IRB. Uh, our Institutional Review Board in August, and we're currently seeking sister institutions who might be interested in giving the survey out at your university, collecting data, and comparing results with our results. 
You can contact me at cmartoni at gsu.edu with any questions, comments, or suggestions. And finally, um, I want to hear from you. We at GSU want to hear from you. And if you are working with Open Educational Resources, we invite you to submit a proposal for our 2025 Open for Student Success Symposium. Thanks. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you Thanks so again. much. Uh, so uh, the link is going to be on the PowerPoint slides. And also, we've got the QR code right there, so you're able to just point your phone at it. Um, but yeah, uh, if you're on the video, you can point it at it right now. But also, if you've got the uh, PowerPoint slides, the link will be right there, too. And some references there. Uh, thank you, Charlene, also for adapting to uh, the weird quirks of teams. <laughs> Uh, so how do we find open educational resources when someone's when faculty are looking for them and they come to a library and says, I don't know how to find OER. It's a little bit different uh, process than what we would do to find library resources. But there are some core tenets of searching that are shared that you really start with the smallest place, the most concentrated place um, that you could find things that are specific to you. And then you end bigger. Uh, oh, Nakia says, uh, any questions for Charlene? Drop your questions uh, in the chat and she'll be able to answer them live uh, at the end. So yeah, uh, it's kind of like starting in one database or even one journal, depending on how big that journal is, and ending in an aggregator, a federated search, a discovery tool, something like that. And of course, we're not just looking for textbooks. If we were, we wouldn't be getting at the breadth of open educational resources and what they can do. Uh, we're also looking for open courses. We're looking for ancillary materials like lecture slides, audio video. Um, we're looking for quizzes, tests, assessments, assignments. Uh, folks aren't always um, comfortable with sharing their quizzes and tests out there. Uh, there's a bit of an apprehension around, well, if my students have the questions, then can't they cheat on the test? Well, there are practice sets of quizzes that can help with that, too, if you want to share that type of thing out. Uh, and then, of course, there are renewable assignments you could um, you can do as a faculty member that allow not only for folks to see a question and still have to authentically uh, respond to it themselves, but respond to it in a way where they could possibly share that response with the rest of the world and help them out too. Uh, so really neat ways of, of looking at uh, OER beyond just textbooks. And not only that, um, let's say that you have an open textbook out there and then you're like, well, that's all of the OER we can find. If that's all of it, then that's all we have for our course. Not quite. Uh, you can use no cost web resources. You can link to them, and that is not copyright infringement. Uh, you can embed things. Uh, YouTube and SoundCloud both have embedding tools that you can just plug right in. Um, library resources, of course. If you have a permalink that enables students to, uh, you know, do their single sign on or log in um, to their library account, they can go right into the library resources that they have access to. Um, if you do that, uh, be sure to cite uh, those resources somewhere so that folks who are not in um, your particular institution still will have some sort of way to get to those materials. Uh, they'll have the citation. They can go find them. Are they at their library? They can interlibrary loan them. If it's just uh, a supplementary resource that one student happens to be interested in, uh, they could do something like an acquisition, e-reserves kind of thing. Um, so yeah, uh, plenty of different ways that you could get to it so long as someone provides the citation to the resource. And of course, your own resources as well. If you're a faculty member, um, sharing those out with the world, if you've got them uh, hiding in D2L, it is a little bit of a jump to share that out with everyone. But I think it's worth it. Uh, it. It's something that helps everyone sustain open education over time. 
Now, of course, no cost resources that don't have open licenses on them have their restrictions. You can't remix them. Um, you can't just copy an entire web page that is free and put it in your open textbook and open license it that same way. You'd really have to point to it. Uh, if you do quotes or something like that, okay, that gets into many different forms of fair use. But when it comes to copying something wholesale, you don't have those same types of remixing permissions that you would with a Creative Commons license. Um, money isn't the only cost with free resources, uh, seemingly free resources. Uh, if you're paying with your data, if you're being tracked, if you have to log into an account and give somebody your information, that is a type of cost that is not exactly money, but still is a student cost. Uh, also think about free resources and how advertisements work. Now it's it's funny and, and almost all well and good if you think about somebody who's watching a 20 minute history video and sees an ad for chewing gum. Okay, yeah, no, probably no harm done unless, I don't know, somebody swallows a, a piece of gum at some point and then you go, oh my goodness, I had them watch that history video. But, but what we're really looking at here are advertisements that could be harmful. Um, I know that when I'm watching YouTube, watching some guy play a, a Nintendo NES game from 1989 or something like that, ads will pop up that are political. Uh, ones that are focused on, well, we know your IP address is in Georgia. So here are all of these crazy attack ads on, you know, any side of an argument. And I was just trying to watch a history video over here. Like, why am I suddenly getting fed political ads? Be sure to look out for that type of thing, too. So money is not the only cost to a student. Sometimes it's their attention. Sometimes it's their data. Uh, be very wary about using no-cost resources for that reason. Now, linking, of course, is not infringement. But if you're linking to something that you know is pirated, it's not going to be on you that it's pirated. But if that gets taken down, now it's on you to find an alternative. So that's not very sustainable. Uh, it's not something that you'd be able to do way down the line. Uh, and if you're linking to things that you know are infringing, uh, that are absolutely for certain infringing, and your sharing of them is not fair use either, then you wind up in kind of weird ethics territory at that point too. Now you can kind of go back into fair use if you're if you really know your stuff and go, well, look, I'm using it for this purpose. And therefore, even though somebody didn't have the right to make a copy of this, I can still use it. Okay, case by case basis when it comes to fair use. But you can't just uh, link to anything the way that you can link to any open resource and say, here it is. And if it's not here, it's definitely gone somewhere else. And if it hasn't gone somewhere else, you ask the open community and somebody will find it and they will put it up because holy moly, that we do not like things to disappear. So here's a couple of examples of how that has worked uh, in the USG. The eCore OER project is one. Uh, eCampus has gone zero cost textbook materials by 2016. They use library resources and they use open educational resources, uh, including some that were a partnership with us and the University of North Georgia Press. East Georgia State College uh, has an American government text. Uh, they have one published by OpenStax, and this was a grant project, and they endured the COVID pandemic and the emergency online instruction shift in the middle of that project, in the middle of getting things done, and saw better student success coming out of that. Uh, so yeah, uh, they brought in no-cost materials to cover some gaps of their particular course, and they have moved on to uh, take a look at those. Georgia Southwestern adopted an open resource that already was an open resource um, in eCore's music appreciation course. And they've gone on to see a lot of positive student perceptions, better learning outcomes, and course level retention. Uh, they've also made some lib guides and study guides. Instead of just having those behind the scenes in D2L, now you've got them for everybody to see. And those study guides give you additional stuff that wasn't included in the book. So you're not directly revising the book at that point, but you are creating ancillary materials to help folks out in ways that are customized towards your students. So yeah, 
Um, our grants are a great way to get into this. So we've had over 600 projects since 2014. Uh, oh, yeah, there are USG examples in our um, repository, both on Manifold and um, on Galileo Open Learning Materials. Uh, this has led to over $136 million in savings since 2014 uh, on textbook costs. Uh, with over 900,000 students affected. These are faculty reported estimates per year. We do sustainability checks on that to make sure that uh, everything is up to date. Um, and we have had every institution participate in our grants. Uh, we have transformation grants, and that's when you take the commercial resource and replace it with free, open, and no cost resources, and also low cost resources if necessary. Uh, so this is a total course transformation. These are the very big projects that wind up in a lot of reporting and also um, a higher per team member cost because it's more of their time. Continuous improvement grants uh, used to be known as mini grants. They are opportunities to improve the things that you've got that are already no cost or low cost. Um, so if you revise OER or you create new OER ancillaries, Continuous improvement grants are a way to do that, to improve your course and share out all the cool stuff that you've made. Research grants are a way of uh, exploring the bigger research questions out there. I can answer questions about our grants, but if someone says, well, what does that mean for open in general, for OER in higher education? Well, I've only got the USG I can talk about. And I've only got their projects and what they've reported. These research questions look deeper into uh, things that may be associated, uh, things that may be cause and effect, uh, ways of looking at data that are more disaggregated than we could do in a grant project. That's what research grants are about. Now, they're a limited funding one uh, because we are not necessarily saving students money using that investment right then and there, but they are ways of exploring affordable education. So they do help in sustainability. Round 26 has already launched. Um, some of you may already have had questions come in uh, from people who would like to apply and say, I need OER in this, I need OER in that. Um, hopefully what you've learned today will help uh, and hopefully the perspectives that you've gotten from uh, our guests will help as well. Uh, applications for the next round are due October 28th. So uh, the application process will start happening in the fall. You may get questions about OER at that point. Now, if you are the one person on your campus who is the contact point for uh, finding OER, if you're the library champion, um, then and you're stumped at that point, there are a couple of things you can do. One, reach out to us. Make sure that there isn't anything else that you've missed over on the USG side of things. But also, um, you can contact uh, the listserv. You can get involved and engaged in that. Uh, and I will, uh, right near the end, talk a little bit about that too. But first, we are going to go to our second guest speaker, and that is Susanna Smith over at Georgia Highlands. Uh, so uh, take it away, Susanna. All right. Well, I don't have slides, um, so you're going to have to just stare at my picture. Um, but. Uh, when when they asked me to to say if to speak for just a few minutes, I thought about okay. So I've been involved in ALG since 2016, so for going on nine years, and I thought, what are the questions that I get asked the most? What 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 do I hear over and over and over again? And what are some tips I might be able to share on how to answer those questions? And Jeff has kind of mentioned some of these things, but I think they're worth reiterating. Um, so. So what are the three questions that I get? Um, the first was, where do I find OER? And Jeff has talked a lot about those resources. My big tip here is get out there and explore before you need to answer the questions. Kind of if you've got a subject specialty that you, you are the librarian for a particular subject, get out there and start looking out to see what's there. Um, and I count library resources in this, absolutely. Sure. Library resources are no cost, but they're not open. But still, if your focus is getting free resources into the hands of faculty so they can get free resources into the hands of students, use the library catalog. I adore those unlimited user ebooks. 
And I have I have helped a lot of faculty find ways to plug those into their courses. And here's my pro tip on this. If a faculty member does decide to pick up an uh, unlimited user ebook as part of their class and whatever for whatever focus they want to use it for, make sure that you let whoever does your ebook purchasing know that you've got a faculty member who's using this as an ebook, that use it using this as an OER. And that way, if this ebook is part of a package and that package gets dropped, you can pick this up as an individual per, per an individual purpose, purpose, oh my gosh, I can't even talk today, purchase. They can purchase it individually so that you don't lose access to that ebook. So that's that's kind of like my pro tip about using library resources. We have a lot of faculty who used Films on Demand as um, video resources. Of course, Galileo just dropped that as a resource, and so now we're kind of struggling to fill in those gaps with Avon and with other resources that we have. So that can be a challenge, but if your goal is to get free content into the hands of students, don't discount what the library has to offer. So that's my first tip. The second tip is, the second question I get is about copyright. I get so many faculty say, can I use this in my class? Can I post this online? Can I upload this to peruse all? So my tip here is, um, you know, become familiar with Creative Commons and copyright. Jeff went through a really quick explanation of what that is, but take some dedicated copyright and fair use workshops. Read up on Fair Use and the Teach Act. And once you kind of know a little bit more, if you start getting um, questions from faculty about that, your first statement is always going to need to be, I'm not a lawyer, so this is not legal advice. And let me tell you how important that is to say, because you don't want any kind of legal responsibility for their decisions. But, you know, if you're aware of that, you can certainly help advise them on not just can I use this article in my class, but you can help them decide what Creative Commons license is going to be the best. And finally, the other big question I get is I've been working on creating open resources. How do I make them visible or public? Again, Jeff has mentioned several great ways to do that. Certainly, their, their uh, manifold is going to be a really useful tool if they're creating a textbook, and I would certainly encourage them to apply for a grant for that. But think about LibGuides. Um, we've got several kind of award-winning resources. Our Introduction in Nursing has won Mer Project Merlot Awards, and it's a LibGuide. That's all it is. It's a LibGuide. And it can be copied by any school with a LibGuide subscription, or a school can just go to the our LibGuide and use it. Um, the nursing guide's actually been used more than 26,000 times um, over the last two years. So not only do we have kind of textbooks in LibGuides, we also have content portals. So our English department has course materials LibGuides. Um, some of our math classes have math portals where they're just housing all the, the videos that they create. They're on YouTube, sure, but this makes it really easy for students to find them. So, you know, and then become familiar with other platforms. Um, the GHC library, we use uh, Google Sites to house our asynchronous information literacy modules. We supplement that with LibWizard quizzes, but that could easily be used as Google Site or Google quizzes as well. So I guess that's really kind of just quickly. I know we're running out of time, um, but those are just three of the big things that I wanted to share with you about questions I get over and over and kind of how I've over the years developed responses to them. And so um, I'll be happy to put a couple of links in chat to uh, some of our LibGuides and um, our AIM modules so that if you want to see kind of what we've been doing. And certainly you're welcome to contact me if you have any questions. Thank you so much, Susanna. And that was that was really helpful stuff. Um, I posted a couple of things in chat. Uh, if you want to get more in depth about both copyright and open licensing, uh, the Creative Commons certification course is an online course that you do have to pay for. It has an instructor, et cetera. But all of those resources that they use to teach are CC licensed and they are free. Uh, the same thing goes for the certificate in OER librarianship for the Open Education Network. 
um, you can pay to take a course and get a certificate in it, but they also have all of those resources available for free. Uh, Susanna is now sharing uh, the AIM uh, lib. Uh, yep, the AIM lib guides over at Georgia Highlands. Thank you so much. So let's say that you're interested in all of this, but you're you're new to it. You'd like to know more. You'd like to do more with it. The first thing you should do is get connected. Um, if you have a champion on your campus, uh, a library champion, if you're a librarian, then connect with them. Uh, see what they're up to and, and what they do and how you can help. Um, there is a listserv, a very important listserv, the Spark Open Education Forum at sparkopen.org. There's the Open Education Conference. Your discipline societies and conferences would love to hear about OER, so please do keep that in mind as you're thinking of scholarship. And at some point, we should have a good social network for open education. We're still talking about that nationwide. I'm going to move this over to Nikita now. Um, we're going to use Poll Everywhere, uh, and I will uh, give her the floor. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to uh, Charlene and Susanna for our, our guest speakers and to Jeff for giving us the overview for the nuts and bolts. We have just a few minutes left, but we really want to hear from you. And so <clears throat> at this point, we're going to do poll everywhere. Um, and so if you wouldn't mind, uh, for those of you who can go ahead and click on your poll everywhere uh, button at the top of the screen there. Um, and then go ahead and skip for now when it comes to registering to participate in the poll. Um, and then I'm going to activate um, our polls so that you can participate. And so you'll notice um, that as the responses are coming in, you'll want to uh, click the button to load more responses if you see those coming in. And the first poll question today um, is what surprised you about uh, what was presented today? You're welcome to type in your answer as well as vote on answers that are coming in. And I'm going to ask Charlene and um, Susanna to um, unmute and uh, put on their cameras because as we participate in the poll, I'd love to hear their commentary and the questions uh, or uh, comments on the responses that we're getting. So we haven't gotten any responses just yet, but if we um, just take a moment uh, to see if any responses for this will come in. For anyone that has what might have surprised you for today's poll for today's, uh, what was presented today. And we'll give that a second or two. And I'll go ahead, uh, Jeff, and share my screen in order to see the results there for yes. that. Yes. Oh, here we go. I got it, don't, yeah, we, we'll do that. Um, let's share this window, there we go. All right, so we'll do that. And so far I'm not seeing, um, let's, any responses as of yet? So what we'll do is move on to the second question in case we have, um, oh, we have one or two there coming in. Okay, so we'll just go ahead and do that. We have, um, I was good to see the the uh, CC licenses and getting that simplified down to four conditions uh, that can be combined. And definitely that has been a very uh, popular thing. And we appreciate um, hearing from uh, Susanna and Charlene, of course, and. Uh, I was surprised that textbooks are such a deterrent for students. Let me scroll down here a little bit. Deterrent for students. Um, that statistic on how much their their, their costs have risen. Definitely. Um, it's definitely been an issue that's been known, but uh, certainly something we haven't paid a lot of attention to. And so the number and variety of platforms available for OER. So as these answers are coming in, just kind of want to wrap up the conversation here. Um, Charlene or Susanna, do you have any comments related to some of the things that have surprised people today? Anything that surprised you? I think um, being able to plug text uh, library resources as textbooks are a great way to show how important libraries are to the institution. Indeed. I'll scroll up again for that. Charlene, any comments from you on what's have surprised our participants today? Uh, yes, it was really nice to hear from my co-presenter that uh, you approach your work in a blended way by using library resources and advocating for them the same way that you would with open resources. I love to see that. That's great. Well, I do appreciate those comments. And we just have a minute left. Um, 
I'm not sure if we can get to the next question, but we'll, we'll just give it 30 seconds perhaps. Um, so what kind of barriers are you guys facing on your campuses when it comes to, um, I need to activate it. Let's do that, let's activate it. Uh, barriers that you might be facing on your campus uh, related to your open education initiatives. Um, we'd maybe just like to see a few of those and uh, then we will go ahead and wrap up for the day. I will just give that just a second. See if it will come in. Yeah. And I think we can, we can probably um, ask the last question for folks that can stick around. Okay. We well, just wouldn't say, hey, you should stick around. <laughs> you know, you got, yeah. It makes sense. It makes sense. So please, for those of you um, who can stick around for just a moment or two beyond our 2 p.m. end time, we would love for you to participate in the remaining questions. We just have one more, and we want to hear a little bit of commentary from Susanna and our Charlene, just in case. So we have a couple of upvotes for the workload um, and would love to hear, um, Charlene, if you want to go first on, on a comment, if you have anything to say about, about that concern, that barrier. Um, that's definitely a barrier that exists at GSU. And, um, one of the question, one of the questions in the survey that we're asking is about their the expectations of their um, their position and whether that has any impact on it. So that can come with workload, but we're also asking about specific barriers that um, came back in a survey that we did a couple of years ago. And one of the barriers was distinctively that professors don't find it uh, like they're going to be getting co enough compensation for it and they don't have enough time for it. And so the way that I've been approaching it is to think, OK, so there must be different ways of compensating in different departments. And what are they and how can I get more information about them so that I can start educating others about the other options in addition to grants? That makes a lot of sense, indeed. And so, Susanna, what about you as far as uh, commenting on some of the uh, barriers that we're seeing here today, like faculty not having time and then a new one that's come in about adoptive resources being removed from oh, yeah. uh, the database is a little warning. Film, films on demand getting dropped. That was that was hard. I mean, Galileo has had films on demand for more than ten years, I think, and seeing it go away. Of course, on the on the flip side of that, um, a lot of people were also uh, commenting that films on demand was starting to be really out of date. And Avon, the new the new database, does seem to have a lot more current and up to date resources. But that's still it's a huge lift for our faculty to suddenly realize they've got a month, a month of overlap between Films on Demand and, and Avon to uh, to do that. And some schools are going ahead and purchasing Films on Demand separately, but a lot of like Georgia Highlands, we don't have the money to to purchase that as a as an our own subscription. So that that is a heavy lift. And and I, I've been working with the folks that I'm the liaison for a particular school, and I've been working with them to try to help find resources. But it's tough. It's tough. Indeed. Yeah. So overcoming the barriers for operating um, open initiatives on, on your individual campuses can definitely be um, something to be concerned about. But that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have a training like this today to kind of talk about how to overcome those. And in the interest of time, we'll just go to the third question very quickly, and I will activate that. And basically, I wanted to know what your takeaway was from today. Um, if you want to throw a couple of answers in there for us, and um, perhaps Charlene and Susanna and Jeff as well can um, wrap it up with um, some of the, the, the key tip or the key thing they want people to have as they walk away today. We'll just give that just about well, a few seconds. Over what? here, you've got a support structure in place. You are not alone. Um, you've got your champions on campus. If you're champions, you've got us. If you're us, <laughs> we've got a national yeah. um, movement and an international movement towards open education as well. Um, and we're, we're trying to uh, enable that in some ways. A, a lot of folks have tried to get a program like Affordable Learning Georgia off the ground in other states. And so we go and we 
just kind of talk to them about it too. Well, we don't go, we go online for the most part and discuss it unless we're at the Open Education Conference. But yeah, uh, everybody in open education is not alone. And the more outreach we can do about that, the better. Uh, the great mechanisms that's play. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Any takeaways from Charlene or Susanna that you want to make sure people live with today? Um. I would say my takeaway is that it's easy to think that every educator knows everything about open education um, and to start talking to them like they are in it all the time. And it's it's necessary to walk that back because we have like graduate teaching assistants, we have research assistants and um, that's my biggest takeaway is that we don't need to always focus on the learning outcome. Um, sometimes we just need the information. <laughs> Indeed. Thank you. Susanna, any last words for us? Um, takeaway? Don't, don't feel like that you're by yourself. I think that that's that you're not, and and you know Jeff just outlined there. You've got resources, and if you're not the library champion, reach out to your library champion. And if you're interested in being involved, reach out to to anyone who's ever done OER at your school and say, hey, how can I get involved? I want to learn more, but I don't want to jump dive in the deep end of the pool. I want to get started small. Thank you very much. So I'll stop sharing and go ahead and put that back in. Jeff's hands, if there's a last slide, a kind of a concluding slide. Nikita, and, what uh, about you? Oh, well, <laughs> about me. Well, as far as the takeaway from here today, I think um, that is the biggest thing I wanted to reiterate is what Jeff has said, um, Susanna said, it, and, and Charlene as well. When it comes to open education, we're not in this alone. That's one of the principles and tenets of, of OER, of open, um, and um, one of the things that ALG tries to uh, promote through our grant programs, as well as through the events that we do like this, is to promote the uh, the principles of open um, and including things like we're sharing and we're trying to be uh, supportive of each other. Um, and so I think that's the one takeaway I want to, to lay down for that. Yeah, other than that, please um, do contact us. Uh, I'm Jeff Gallant, she's Nikita Faha. It's just our first name dot last name at uh, usg.edu to email us and uh, we can definitely help out with any questions that you have. And thank you so much to both Charlene and Susanna for being here and uh, sharing their perspectives as well. Thank you for being here and being engaged about affordable learning. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.